cells. Cells, as you may know, are microscopic units that contain the basics of life and allow life to exist. All living things are made of cells, and all these cells work together, and sometimes there are more specialized cells that specialize in a certain function or work for something specific, such as red blood cells, white blood cells, or nerve cells. And together they become the building blocks of larger complex systems. Molecules form cells, cells form tissues, tissues form organs, and those organs work together to create your organ systems. And it wasn't until 1665 when Robert Hooke invented the first microscope. Cells were discovered and many didn't know of the existence of the cell. It may seem like common knowledge to everyone now that we're all made of cells and all living things are made of cells. But back then this wasn't the case. Robert Hooke was able to see cells on a piece of cork through his invention, the compound microscope, which would use multiple lenses and light to magnify an image of an object. Other forms of microscopes are scanning electron microscopes, SEM, which produce an image by scanning the surface with a focused beam of electrons. The electrons in the beams interact with the sample, producing various signals that can be used to obtain information such as the surface of the cell and the composition. Another microscope is a transmission electron microscope. EMS employ a high voltage electron beam in order to create an image. An electron gun at the top of a TEM emits electrons that travel through the microscope or through the, through the microscope's vacuum tube. Rather than having a glass lens focusing the light, like light microscopes, like a TEM employs an electromagnetic lens, which focuses the electrons into a very fine beam. This beam then passes through the specimen, which is very thin, and the electrons either scatter or hit a fluorescent screen at the bottom of the microscope. Then an image of the specimen with its parts sh shown in different shading appear on the screen. This image can then be studied directly within the TEM or photographed. SEMs or scanning electron microscopes are better for studying the surfaces of cells, surfaces of cells and small organisms, while the TEM or the transmission electron microscope are, are better for studying the internal structures of the cell. As you may know, there are two different types of cells, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryote cells are lack a nucleus and they don't have membrane-bound organelles, so everything is floating around. The DNA of prokaryotes is located in the central part of the cell called the nucleoid. There are only, there are only two types of cells that are prokaryotic, bacteria and archaea. Most bacteria have a cell wall made of peptidoglycan, a polymer of linked carbohydrates and small protein proteins. The cell wall gives a form of protection to the cell and helps it maintain its shape. Bacteria also have an outer layer of carbohydrates called a capsule. It helps the capsule attach to the surfaces in the environment. Usually prokaryotes have a flagella, which is a whip-like structure that acts as a motor for the bacteria to move around. Bacteria also have fimbriae, which are hair-like structures that are used to attach to other cells and surfaces. They also have a rod-like structure to transfer DNA to other bacteria. Archaea share most of the features, most of these features, but they slightly differ. One example is a cell wall. Archaea has a cell wall, but its compo composition differs than that of a bacteria. Eukaryotic cells differ from prokaryotic cells. For example, eukaryotes have a membrane have membrane-bound organelles, which you may be familiar with. One organelle can be the mitochondria, and they carry a membrane-bound nucleus, which houses the genetic material for the cell. And eukaryotes are typically animal cells, and bacteria are prokaryotic. And I will now explain to you the different. Membrane-bound organelles that eukaryotic cell has. 
Let's just start off the, nu the nucleolus. The nucleolus is found within the nucleus, and all the chromosomes within the nucleus put together their genes to produce ribosomes in an area within the nucleus. Because of this, one area of the nucleus tends to be darker because of all the ribosome production. In the area, they produce ribosomal RNA. Then it will build some of the proteins using existing ribosomes outside of the nucleus. Then it moves in. Then it moves back in the nucleus, and it will be assembled. And after the nucleolus, as nucleus, as you may know as the what controls the cell, the brain of the cell, as you may know it. And this was one of the first organelles to be discovered. It contains genetic material inside the nucleus, and this determines what kind of cell the cell is going to be, and also controls what the cell is going to be doing, such as producing proteins, enzymes, etc. It contains pore on it, pores on it, and its cell material is able to enter and exit the nucleus. After the nucleus, we have ribosomes, and ribosomes build proteins in both inside both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And however, because they both produce or they both have ribosomes, eukaryotic ribosomes and prokaryotic ribosomes have slightly have slight differences. But they, they're both used to build proteins. And the rough ER is after that. The rough ER is a membrane which is continuous to the nucleus. And it's called the rough ER because it's studded with ribosomes on the outside. These ribosomes can attach and detach as it isn't part of the ER, but they attach to the ER when it starts synthesizing proteins. One of the main functions of the rough ER is to produce and process specific proteins. These are exported through the secretory, secretory pathway after they are exported via the membrane vesicles. They can be sent to the Golgi apparatus to be further processed or to the organelles directly. And they can even be exported to out they can even be exported outside the cell and into another part of the body. Ribosomes create proteins which are embedded into the rough ER for further further processing. And water soluble proteins are created as well, and these are exported through the membrane into the lumen. After the rough ER, we have the Golgi body, and it consists of a stack of membrane-bound sacs called cisternae. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, cisternae. The proteins leaving the Golgi apparatus are directed to the appropriate destination depending on the function, including the cell surface, a lysosome, or a secretory vesicle. After that, we have the cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton is responsible for the structure of the cell and the movement of the cell. Other properties include positioning organelles within a cell, directing transport between intercellular com compartments. The, the cytoskeleton is associated with motor proteins, which generate movement and they allow the cell to be dynamic. So it allows the cell to move easier. The smooth ER is... It lacks the ribosomes that the rough ER has, but it produces lipids and different steroids and transports them. Other functions include metabolism of carbohydrates and steroids, and its detoxification of drugs. So the smooth ER is is very useful when you're when you have when you're drunk, when you're under the influence of some drugs or something. It helps cl clear them out. And after that, we have one of the most important cells, one of the most important organelles, the mitochondria, or the powerhouse of the cell. And this is the, the one that you may be most familiar with. And the mitochondria produces energy, known as ATP. Mitochondria has its own DNA, and it replicates through binary fission. It produces energy throughout many steps, usually the Krebs cycle, and the end yield is 36 ATP. And after that, we have vacuoles. And vacuoles are an organelle. They're typically found only, oh, not only, but they're usually found in plant cells. 
and it's used to store water to keep the plants so firm and turgid. After that, we have cytosol, which we used to believe that cytosol was a very simple part of the cell, but more studies have been coming out and taking place, and we're finding out more, more about how compli complicated cytosol actually is. Cytosol is the fluid in which organelles of the cell reside in. This is often confused with cytoplasm, but cytoplasm is the space between the nucleus and the plasma membrane. Therefore, cytosol isn't technically an organelle, but it's still very important. The primary component of a cytosol is water, and water makes up 70% of a cell. And this water is primarily in the cytosol to dissolve other components. This includes polar molecules and ions, or charged particles. And the water can be used to assist in chemical reactions within the cell and this will help in the cellular metabolism. Proteins and other macromolecules will also dissolve in the cytosol when not in use. So, that's pretty neat. Not a lot of people know too much about the cytosol. Or some people confuse it with the cytoplasm, but now you know the difference. After that, we have the lysosomes. And lysosomes are digestive enzymes that break down other material. If the material in the lysosome were to burst, and the material in it would break down the ins the material inside of the lysosome would break down the inside of the cell. My AP bio teacher used to say that when you think of lysosomes, think of things like Lysol. Lysol breaks things down to make it to make it easier to clean. And also, in the word lysosome, it contains the Greek word lysis, which means to cut. So, you could use that. Lysosome, lysis, means to cut. It's a neat little way to remember it. And after that, we have centrioles. And the main function of the centriole is to help with the cell division in animal cells. The second function of the centriole is, focuses on ciliogenesis. Ciliogenesis is simply the formation of the cilia and the flagella on the surface of the cell. Centrioles are little tube-like structures that aid in cell division. They generally are found close to the nucleus and are made up of nine tube-like structures that each have three tubules. And you may be wondering, after all these organelles, all, all of these things that make up a cell, why are they so tiny? Why are cells so small? Well, cells are small because they need to take in and let out materials inside the cells. They take in oxygen and release materials such as carbon dioxide through a process called diffusion. If cells were larger, then it would take a long time for material to get in and to come out. Instead, cells are small and have more surface area. However, if cells were too small, then there wouldn't be enough space for the organelles, DNA, and other important materials. Therefore, cells need to be a certain size. They need to be a certain size to efficiently diffuse material and to fit all the necessary components inside of it. So it can't be too small because then the organelles wouldn't fit. And it can't be too large because it can't take too long for material to come in and out. So the size that cells are now is important because it's allowed, it allows for efficient transportation of materials inside a cell. I hope you guys liked today's video. I know it's not history, but I really also like biology, and I really like making these biology videos, even though they take me a little bit longer to make because I want to research the material to make sure I don't sound dumb. <laughs> and I may have mispronounced any words. If I did, I'm sorry. But that will be today. That will be it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hope you guys liked the video, fell asleep felt more relaxed by it. Good night, everyone. Have a good one. Hey, guys. This is a quick little edit because I kind of forgot to put in a chloroplast. And chloroplast is an organelle in the cell. Oops. It's not found in animal cells, but it's found in plant cells. Chloroplasts are used to go through photosynthesis where plants convert the energy from the sun or from light to ATP that they can use to go through photosynthesis.
photosynthesis and convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. Another quick little edit is I briefly mentioned vacuoles, but I forgot to mention that vacuoles for animal cells. Vacuoles hold in water or material for animal cells, and they may even hold in waste from the animal cell. So, I'm sorry, I kind of forgot to, I don't know how I forgot about it, but I'm now I added it to the end of the video. But I hope you guys enjoy this.